Industrial Development Board meeting. It is right at 10.04 a.m. Uh, we do have a quorum, so we'll, we will go ahead and start this meeting. Uh, first item up for consideration is the approval of the July 14th IDB meeting minutes. I will give everyone a couple of minutes to give those a quick review, um, and then we will move forward from there. Thank you. Move approval. Can I make a motion, sir? Move approval. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second motion uh, on the table. So in a second, uh, any discussion regarding the minutes from July? All right, let's take a vote. All those in favor to move forward, say aye. 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 All right, all those opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you all. Sorry, give me one second here. We're working on technology today. All right, well, thank you. And I will, if the, if my fellow board members will allow me some wiggle room and flexibility, I'd like to kind of come off the agenda a tad bit. We are Welcome to have one of our elected officials here joining us this morning, uh, Council Member Toombs. For those of you who do not know, Council Member Toombs is chair of the Budget and Finance Committee for Metro. Um, and I reached out to her, and I'm glad that she took time out of her busy day uh, to come and talk with us specifically about the Metro incentives that we'll be talking about later. Again, she has a very busy schedule, so would love to uh, be able to give her the opportunity and platform to share her thoughts about how these impact the budget and overall impact on Nashville from her perspective as a council member. Thank you. Ah, for, okay. Can you hear me better? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It all gets us, we always talk without pushing it too, so no worries. I think for council, it, it lights up green, so this is, this is weird. A little but different. Anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, good morning, uh, board members, and thank you, Chair, for the invitation. My comments will be uh, brief. Uh, this morning, you'll be reviewing some incentives, and I was asked to speak on the impact to the budget. And as you all know, uh, the city is required by state law to have a structurally balanced budget. And that's what the council passed on June 15th of this year. Uh, so these incentives uh, don't have any type of, of negative impact or any type of strain on the budget. We've already passed a very healthy budget, uh, $2.65 billion. So these incentives are actually, though a large number, uh, in total amount is a very small percentage of the total budget. Um, it's it's uh, easy to have, uh, I guess, 2020 hindsight uh, after deals are done and, and think that we could have gotten a better deal. Um, but at the time these deals were made, they, they were considered to be good deals. And you think about Nashville is competing with other cities anytime you have corporations come into Nashville. And the name of the game has been to offer incentives. It's still to offer incentives. And I think the current administration has been uh, doing a, a fairly good job of trying to minimize uh, the fiscal impact to, to Nashville. And so uh, again, these incentives don't have a, a large impact on the budget. They're a small percentage of the total budget. Um, and we've already committed to paying them. <laughs> so as our finance director always says, we need to uphold our obligations. Uh, we're in a very good financial state as a city. That hasn't always been the case, but this year uh, we're in a really good place. Um, and moving forward, I, I think that sustainability will be maintained. Uh, and again, uh, these incentives are not, don't have a negative impact on that. 
Well, well, thank you for sharing. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll go to the board and just see if they have any other, any quick questions for you. Uh, like I said, I, we really appreciate you taking the time to come speak with us today. I'll start to my left, left with uh, board member Allen. Any questions related to that on your end or comments? Uh, thanks for being here again, Council Member. Yeah. Just a general, like, you know, as far as incentives, um, are you guys, what's your general overview on, you know, doing more in the future and just kind of where you feel like your council, I know you can't speak for all the other members, but um, where the council's at on these kind of things. And, and you're right, I can't speak for everyone, but I think uh, the general consensus in the council is to minimize the amount that Nashville has to pay. Um, I think that in the, the past couple of deals that have uh, been public, We've seen um, with the redoing of the stadium deal to to, minim to reduce the financial uh, obligation of, of Metro uh, with the Oracle deal where there is no financial obligation on the part of Metro. Um, I think that there is definitely a, a sentiment in the council to minimize uh, the financial uh, obligations of Metro. However, I do not think there is an I don't think that most people are adverse to offering incentives if there's going to be a return on the investment. Thank you for that. And of course, you know, we usually see the deals first, so it's always good to know where council's kind of currently sitting. So thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you, board member Davis. I'll go down to board member Johnson if you have any questions or comments for council member Tim. All right. Thank you. Board member Forrester, any comments or questions? All right, thank you. Vice Chair? No, just thanks for coming and sharing. No problem, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, again, we, we thank you for, you know, first of all, your perspective on, on these, and, and I think it was important to uh, consider that may, although you may not have been involved personally in, in, in voting on all of these, some of these deals that, that uh, predated you, uh, your time serving the city, uh, I think you made a, a valid point about you know, agreements are uh, are in place, and that's certainly something that has to be considered. Uh, so anyway, we thank you for that, and thank you for your perspective moving forward, and uh, we hope to have you back. Uh, feel free to come back anytime, and again, we thank you for your dedication and service to the city. Obviously, the it's been a very difficult, I would think, couple of years with the budget due to all the challenges we face, so we really appreciate you and, and your role, and serving on that very important committee and thank you for serving the people of nashville thank you and thank you all for your service as well thank you thank you have a wonderful day you too all right well uh, again we want to thank council member tombs and I, I appreciate the the my fellow board members giving me some giving us some flexibility on that uh, we will now uh, open up for public comment period uh, if there's anyone that wishes to speak, we will, uh, if you could, just go to the podium. And Courtney, if, yeah, we'll put a timer on for, for three minutes. So we will open it up for a public comment period. All right, as there does not seem to be anyone wishing to speak, we will close the public comment period and move on to item number four, which is old business, discussion related to the issuance and or modification of the industrial revenue bonds for Nashville Leasing Housing Associates 3LP. Uh, and I will just give quick overview for folks. So this is related to the Dominium development that is uh, on Dickerson Road, uh, North Dickerson, adjacent to the Walmart and Lowe's Shopping Center. Uh, several board members, including myself, were able to attend the uh, groundbreaking ceremony several years ago. Uh, and if you recall, back in the winter, uh, they had to come before this board due to some extraordinary cost uh, that they had during construction, some, some land challenges that we discussed. So they had to, uh, they needed more money related to the bonds. And uh, if you recall, I asked Margaret to send out some pictures. So some of them are uh, some of the units are, there are already people living in there, very nice units, uh, great area, again, very close to amenities, uh, shopping, and also close to, obviously, public transit and close to the interstate and close to Brawley Parkway. 
Uh, so really great location and obviously that affordable housing has been something that this board has really focused on and been very supportive of um, and uh, we have been supportive of this development. So that's kind of the uh, background. Courtney, I'll turn it over to you if you want to provide more detail specifically on, on what we're dealing with today. Well, I think today was just more of a discussion of the item. Um, it's not an approval process. I believe Attorney Took was going to give an overview of what's going on with the process and the project, but uh, I don't see Attorney Took here. So with that, um, I'll kind of leave my comments there. All right, and maybe what we'll do is, if it's okay with the uh, fellow board members in the event that, uh, because this is not an item that we have any need to vote on or approve, we'll move this to the, towards the end of the agenda um, in the event that, oh, here we go. Speak, here we go. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we, um, if it's okay, why don't we move this towards the, uh, we'll move this later in the agenda and then we'll come back I'll come back to it if that's okay, board members. No worries. Nashville traffic, you can't get around anywhere, right? Quickly. Uh-oh, I don't know if we want to hear any more of this story. <laughs> yeah, don't tell us any more, Bob. No more. We don't want to hear any more of this story. All right, so we'll come back to that. Let's go to new business approval of... Tennessee capital grant of $65 million for the benefit, benefit of Amazon Services, LLC. Um, there are a couple items related to this. One, there's a grant agreement between the state of Tennessee and the Industrial Development Board. Item two, there's a grant between the Industrial Development Board and Amazon. And item three, there's an accountability agreement between the state of Tennessee, Amazon Services, LLC, and the Industrial Development Board. I do want to make sure that everyone is clear for those of us who were on the board several years ago. We did approve a Metro incentive grant uh, for Amazon. This is totally separate and is not in any way related to the Metro incentive. This again is a state grant and uh, really excited to have Amazon before us today. I understand they brought a team of folks to talk with us today, uh, which is great. So if you will, from your standpoint, maybe uh, give us, you know, a quick summary on, 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 these, on these three items today, some background maybe on the state grant, and then I'll certainly turn it over to our board members that may have questions in general about uh, your transition and move here to Nashville, and we will go, f we'll, we'll stop there. So thank you. Thank you. And please introduce your team as well who is here with you. The, it's want, red to the right. Board Chair. You may want to call up uh, the, from the state also, Lindy Baronis. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Let's do, let, let me, let me, let me go back. Let me have the state first. Thank you. <laughs> I've seen your email, so great to, great to meet you. So we'll do that first. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go to, to Amazon. So thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Lindy Baronis with the State of Tennessee's Economic and Community Development Department. Do you want me to give just a, a quick yeah, overview? Just, yes, so thank the, you. The $65 million grant it is what we consider a capital grant, which is a little bit different than what your IDB board sees from us. Typically, you see economic development grants straight from our office, um, from our ECD budget. This is a capital grant because of the size of the grant itself. So it was allocated from the state budget as a whole. And so it is a, the only difference in this grant and what you see on a regular basis from us in a typical ED grant pass through is that it is administered by the state's architect's office, but everything else from an accountability agreement, contract, your separate contract directly with the company itself is all the same. The accountability agreement is the same. It's just the company submits their reimbursable background that they would typically submit to us for approval to the state's architect's office. They approve it and then the allocation is sent to you guys to then be paid 
um, to Amazon directly. So you're still acting just as a pass through for the grant funds and all of the $65 million for this grant was approved for construction and site, Im site improvements. Thank you, and, and just to clarify, the, the only reason this is set up a tad bit differently than others is just due to the sheer dollar amount of the grant, is that correct? Correct, we've done a handful of capital grants across the state, this is the first one that's done in Metro, um, and so very comfortable and very used to these, but this is the first one here. The only difference is that it's a capital grant allocated from the state's general budget as opposed to coming from ECD funds directly. Oh, yes, thank you. And then for, for mine, if you can too, just, and I'll, I'll certainly uh, turn it over to my colleagues, but from the state's perspective, can you speak to what was, you know, a couple of factors that, that made it worthwhile to, to certainly, this is obviously a, a significant amount of money. Again, it's not, this is not tied to the Metro incentive, but we certainly all live here in Tennessee and uh, we pay sales taxes. So, uh, you know, in some ways, even though it's not Metro, it's still our money, yep. uh, taxpayer money. What, what are some of the factors that, that led to the state, you know, moving towards this deal, you know, this dollar figure. I mean, for, it's for very Amazon much here. in line. In fact, if you do a cost per job analysis, it's actually lower in many ways than the average cost per job for many of our projects. But the sheer size of 5,000 jobs and the capital investment of this project, we have a matrix formula that our state office puts projects into along with using historical projects of similar average wages. So because this type of entity is very different from their typical distribution center, the wages are very high. Capital investment, obviously building a new development in downtown, very significant, and the job creation numbers very high. So that made the total overall number that you see large, but at the end of the day, our ROI is very, very strong for this project, and we're very excited to have Amazon um, choose Tennessee for this. I know you guys know the backstory, but I think going through the process and, and working with them to you know recruit Amazon here for this project, we were a little nervous at the HQ2 name when they were talking about 25,000 jobs or even larger than that. And I think Nashville, when we were in competition for that, obviously we wanted, we wanted that HQ2 project, but in many of the conversations we were like, how do we handle this? Like if we win this, how do we handle that number of jobs? What kind of, what does that mean for our infrastructure for our downtown? And so in the 11th hour when Amazon came to us and, and said, you're not necessarily picked for the HQ2 project, but we have a subset of a 5,000 job project that's very specific to logistics and, and technology. We said we could definitely deal with that. That's something in our wheelhouse that we're really excited about. So we're very, we're very happy to have them in, in, our, in our city and in our state. And that's, that's how we got to that number. Yeah, thank you. That was that. Thank you. That was a lot of, at least for me, a lot, very insightful, a lot of great detail. You know, certainly, you know, we like to, you know, ROI is important when you're looking at these deals, and uh, it's certainly helpful to kind of understand the the background on, you know, the factors that really drive it to make why it seemed like it was worth it to move forward with, again, something this sheer size. So great to hear that on the cost per job analysis. That, that was excellent information. All right, if you'll stay up for a second, yes. Lindy, stay there. Uh, well, well, before you do that, I'm gonna check with our my yes. colleagues, see if yes. they may have some specific questions for you from the state perspective, if you'll hold tight. So I'll start on the other end, I'll start. My opposite end, Board Member Johnson, any questions or comments for the on the state piece? All right, thank you. Board Member Forrester. Board Member Allen. Yeah. Board Member Davis. I'll just comment. Uh, sure. You know, we appreciate the grant. Uh, always, you know, with the state's coffers, always nice to, uh, <laughs> y'all have a little deeper pockets than us, so nice to see these coming out of the state. We're and, happy uh, to step in and help. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Of course, we did, you know, work with uh, Amazon for Metro as well, and uh, but we appreciate the state. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, Lindy, thank you. If we'll have a representative from Amazon and Lindy in, in, in case, if you want to take a seat up front in case there's some more questions, but we appreciate it and thank you for the thorough explanation. 
Hello, good morning, Jessica Bro. I good morning. Work for Amazon's economic development team based here in Nashville, um, but support our investment projects throughout the Southeast. So thanks for the opportunity to talk with you all. And do you want any, anyone else from your team if you want sure, to introduce them? Sure, there may be a couple quick. of other folks who choose to speak there. Uh, oh, okay, perfect. To Nigel's point, there are a couple of us here this morning. So Michelle Brown and Courtney Ross um, are here. So Michelle, you all probably know and have worked with. She works a lot directly on public policy with Metro. And then Courtney Ross, uh, who supports our team from an external affairs capacity. And then last but not least, Lloyd Chi, uh, who supports our team from an economic development legal standpoint, traveled in from Seattle just to say hi to you all this morning. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so I can certainly elaborate a little bit on so, sort of where we are um, from the perspective of what we call Amazon Nashville, which is the headquarters location uh, that we have here in, in, in downtown, uh, which is, oh, I would say about 50% in terms of construction. So the first tower uh, we do, we'd actually started moving into that building. Uh, some of our associates did this week. We certainly are still on work from home guidance. I think most of you know that. So our team is able to work from home, but the office is open now for people who want to go in as long as they follow, you know, certainly masking protocols and then any other local protocols and procedures. So we're excited to have that first tower open and have people in it. As Lindy mentioned, our original commitment to Nashville and to the state of Tennessee was 5,000 new full-time jobs and a capital investment of $230 million. To date, we've hired roughly 2,000 associates um, that are working for Amazon Nashville and certainly have uh, additional job opportunities somewhere around 300 currently open on our website. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's outstanding. And then do you want to speak to any, were there any other details that uh, you want to pro provide in from Amazon's perspective specifically related to uh, this $65 million capital grant from sure. the state? Sure. I can talk some about that. So from the grant perspective, uh, and I believe Lindy mentioned this, but how these funds will be used as part of the construction and tenant improvements uh, in the two towers that, that are under construction as part of the larger Nashville Yards development. So some of the infrastructure, site preparation costs, and then again, just that internal tenant build out uh, is how those funds are being used for this particular grant. Outstanding. That sounds great. And is is there anyone else from your company that wants to come up and speak at all right now? Would you guys like to come up and speak at all? <laughs> if you want to. You're, no pressure. Yeah. No, we can certainly take questions from the board. And then if there's, you know, something that's in the wheelhouse of Michelle or Courtney, more from a community engagement, external fair standpoint, they'll certainly jump in and provide answers for those. Okay. Sure. Outstanding. So we're, we're so a couple quick, at least on mine, and, mm -hmm. and like I said, I'll, we'll certainly... I turn it over to the to my colleagues. So specifically on this state grant, um, obviously this is a capital grant for for tenant improvements for TI. Uh, what's the status of the second? You talked about the first tower. Mm -hmm. What do you look at timing wise um, on second tower? And if and just big picture, obviously, you know the war, we've all been affected by sure. uh, challenges in the world the last eighteen months. Where, where do you look at? When do you look at your office potentially? kind of opening up fully uh, based on everything we know to this point. And then like I said, where are we on the second tower? Any updates on that? Sure, so work from home currently, um, our associates are able to work from home through January, but certainly from an Amazon perspective, we want to be back in the office. We're fully committed to being back in the office. Uh, and as I said, some of our associates are choosing to work from the office currently, but they have to do, you know, follow masking protocols and local protocols and procedures uh, around workplace safety. So actually, I worked from our office uh, earlier this week. Courtney was there as well. So a lot of us are starting to utilize that space because we're really excited about it and happy to, you know, be in the office there. From the perspective of Tower 2, it is under construction currently. Um, so just certainly, you know, from a to your point, supplies and raw materials and all the things that are just sort of hard to get these days, um, we're looking at probably a 12 to 18 month time frame to have that tower, second tower complete. Thank you. And, I, and you all just finalized the lease for that recently too, correct? That's if, correct. Okay. So obviously, you know, you, you have some confidence that the world will at some, at some way, shape or form, get back to this new normal, we call it. But just curious from our perspective, I, I just recently did our corporate office lease at uh, where I work uh, last year. 
and certainly our office is kind of following the same protocol. I guess it's similar to, to yours where it's open, but we're not all the way open and it's restricted on how many people and, you know, you have to wear a mask, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You have to check in. So um, totally different. So obviously you've got a huge two towers downtown. Mm -hmm. Do you envision that, is it Amazon's envision just big picture philosophically that, you know, if this gets behind us and, you know, two or three years down the road that people will be back into the office, uh, you know, on a more regular basis? Yes, 100%. So that's our commitment. That's our plan. So right now our work from home guid guidance is through January of next year, but we fully intend to have our associates back in the office. We feel like that's the best place for collaboration. It's the best place for innovation is for our associates to have an opportunity to be in the same room to see each other. I know personally I have missed people. Uh, sure. <laughs> so I am anxious for those days as well to get back to a more what I'll call traditional office environment. But absolutely, that's our, our plan and our intention is to be back in the office. Yeah, it's certainly different when you're on meetings with folks in on Zoom and your internet starts fading <laughs> exactly. out and it's distorted. It's <laughs> frozen in a weird, you know, weird way. For sure. And, and I think that's something we, I know I can relate to this board. We, this is, I think, our third, only our third meeting in person since March of last year. So that's certainly something I know on a personal level that I can relate to. So I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. Uh, so a couple of questions for more kind of on a different note mm -hmm. that maybe just let you all and this may be a better question for some of your other colleagues sure. but a couple of things and I'll turn it over to my colleagues if they have any questions about Amazon or the uh, state grant so a couple of things that I think I that I'm curious about because obviously Amazon I was on the board um, several years ago not every not everybody currently on the board was but I was one of the members that was on the board when this came before us for the metro incentives and there was certainly a lot of talk about impact on traffic which we heard somebody was you know late today for traffic even though you're not at full capacity so that's not Amazon <laughs> but um you know, there was some talk about that and, and impact on housing prices. So a couple of things, if, if you can speak to one, uh, I want to say that I read something that you all will be giving incentives up uh, to people to bike or who take public transportation to work. Mm -hmm. Obviously not maybe as huge of a deal right now, sure. but once you're fully back up. So if you can speak to that. And then also, uh, as you heard me say earlier, uh, this board has been very intent uh, about being very supportive about any way mm -hmm. uh, that we can positively impact affordable housing, the cost of housing. I think that all people acknowledge uh, what's going on in Nashville and the, the, the rising prices. Sure. And, and certainly um, that's something that this board has been intent about. So if you can talk about to your donation that you all made over $2 million to the housing fund. Yep. I think that would be something our board would be interested in. And then lastly, on my end, uh, which I don't know that this has gotten a lot of publicity, but I read that uh, you all wrote a letter, your company wrote a letter in support of the interstate cap um, in North Nashville, um, where it's a project looking at, you know, capping, mm -hmm. doing something over the interstate in that community. Um, and for folks that don't know, there's some history there when the interstate came through Nashville, kind of separated that community mm -hmm. from the rest of the city. And like I said, I, I haven't seen that a lot, but I was pleasantly and, and happy to read about that, uh, that your company, you know, wrote a letter in support of that project. So maybe if you can talk yeah. about those things and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues for any other questions. Absolutely. And I've noticed Thank you. That, that Michelle and Courtney have stepped up. And so that's probably all of those questions are certainly much more in their wheelhouse in terms of what we've done uh, from a community engagement standpoint, which we're really excited about the partnerships we have here. So I'll step back and uh, let you guys jump in. Good morning, Michelle Brown. Thank you so much for having us this morning. So from a traffic perspective, something that um, Amazon has always encouraged our employees all across the country and the world is to um, make sure that we are participating in public transportation. So there are incentives for our employees to take the bus, any kind of transportation options that are available in the area in which they live. And one of the things we noticed in Nashville is that there is a general overall traffic problem. So we were really excited about the incentives to encourage our employees to bike to work if feasible. And so I think that has prompted a lot of conversations for us to discuss with other companies in the city how we can make sure we have that infrastructure to support that. 
that. So um, great commuter options for our employees are always always the case because we know traffic was a problem before we showed up and it will be after and so we are more than excited to participate in that. Um, I believe the second thing you asked was about housing. When we announced we were coming to Nashville, one of the biggest things we always heard about was Nashville's affordable housing um, well, lack of inventory for sure. affordable housing. And so when we were thinking about that, we were trying to figure out what we can do to get involved in affordable housing. And around the same time, there was the property tax increase. And so we knew there would be a lot of families impacted over the holidays and in general, not being able to cover that cost um, that was due in January or February. So we were gracious and fortunate to partner with Marshall Crawford at the Housing Fund and provide $2.25 million to cover property taxes for families in eight zip codes that were hit hardest by the tornadoes and the floods. And so families have been actively applying and receiving funding for that. And the housing fund has been a great partner um, in just making sure that the community is aware of this and making sure that people are applying. Um, a month after we announced our partnership with the housing fund, we announced a $2 billion housing equity fund to preserve and create 20,000 units of affordable housing across three of our corporate locations, Nashville, the Puget Sound area in Washington State, and Arlington, Virginia, where our HQ2 is. And with that, we are looking to partner with developers and nonprofits in the area who've been working in affordable housing for years and just being able to be a resource to provide funding for that. Um, in addition to the $2 billion, because we know that in development, in affordable housing, equity is always an issue. We have a separate $125 million set aside to ensure that minority-led nonprofits and minority developers are able to have a seat at the table and receive the support that they need so they can help build these homes in Nashville as well. Um, and a third part of that, as you all may have seen, is that, again, transit and transit-oriented development is a huge part of affordable housing, and so we have invested and committed $75 million to Nashville to build 800 units of homes um, over the next few years. So we are excited to partner with WeGo with that to make sure on our dense, most dense corridors that we able, are able to have housing close by. Um, I think I and the last the third one was thing. about the, the interstate cap. Oh, okay. <laughs> in support of that in North Nashville. Okay, perfect. Um, another thing, again, we are we want to be a great community partner. We are really excited about our public-private partnership with the city, and something that we know is a gem in Nashville is North Nashville, where our four HBCUs are. Um, and we know that Jefferson Street in that area was a huge economic driver and had a lot of great small businesses many years ago. And so when we were talking to the city about helping North Nashville as far as economic development, one of the biggest things we heard about was the Jefferson Street cap. And so we knew that if the city received funding to build that cap, there may be um, instances where people may be displaced. And so we wanted to come in and support and say, hey, if people are displaced, we want to make sure that there's money set aside so they are able to remain in the neighborhood and have a great home for themselves and their families. So we were grateful to write the letter of support and are excited to see what happens with that in the future. Well, thank you for <laughs> for answering those. You, yes. It was a very thorough explanation, so I, I appreciate it. I will uh, turn it over to my colleagues in case they have any comments or questions. Okay. I'll start over here with Board Member Allen. Any questions or comments? First of all, you guys um, are doing an amazing job of knowing um, the pressure points of our city and obviously hiring someone like you and Courtney, um, who knows our city more than anyone, has allowed Amazon to take it at a higher level coming in. I see other companies that are coming in um, rising because of what you've done, and we really appreciate that. You're looking at areas that a lot of people fail to see that have been here for so long, and I love the fresh eyes, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Board Member Davis. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you guys for being here. Um, I can build on that. Definitely, uh, it's really good to hear a lot of these um, community engagement. Um, you know, I think all of us weren't totally sure how it would be when, mm -hmm. You know, this was first announced many years ago, and um, definitely really great to, to hear that. Um, super supportive of the grant. You know, just a couple comments and questions. Um, just, you know, it's how often do we get Amazon in front of us? You know, it's really great to have that's, you. That's, hey, they brought the whole team, <laughs> yeah, so why not? Right, so we might as well ask something. Um, and so with the, with the building side of it, um, I, I, I should know this, and you've probably said it many times in the past. Are you guys doing like lead and sustainability efforts on the on the buildings, or is that is that like a landlord 
thing or, um, you know, just any kind of uh, environmental efforts? Yeah, so that's part of all of our builds now. So we work with developer on this project. So Seneca helped develop it. Um, and so part of our efforts with them related to Amazon's overall goals of the climate pledge certainly include features of the building that support LEED certification. We don't typically pursue actual LEED designation on our facilities, um, but we do implement things within the building that you know allow for sustainability. We have EV chargers that are part of the development for associates driving electric vehicles. There's lighting features in the build, building and all sorts of things that help make it sustainable. Sure, and you know, buildings are just such a big part of um, you know, issues with climate change and that sort of thing. So yep. we want to see the global, you know, the big dogs kind of leading on that for sure. Um, second with the building is... Am is Amazon a big dog? I, mean, I would, you know, <laughs> probably one of the bigger companies ever. Um, with uh, Also with that, you know, just one of the things I worked on at Council is kind of like good contracting standards, you know, and I know you guys will be reporting on the Metro mm -hmm. side of it. I mean, now that we're into construction, um, do you feel like, you know, we've been operating under good contractor standards and that sort of thing with labor and as we're building these buildings, since that's what this kind of grant is passing through for? Yeah, absolutely. So again, Seneca and as our developer manages that process for us, but certainly from the general contractor perspective, all the way through our subcontractor process, that is a competitive process. Um, so we make those opportunities available to businesses that want to do business with us or have an opportunity to be a part of the project. So that's certainly something that, um, you know, has happened throughout the course of the construction of Tower 1 and then going into Tower 2 as well. And we haven't heard any problems, so that's a, that's definitely a good thing. Um, you know, just always looking to um, have our larger projects be more, you know, OSHA certifications, just safety. We've had issues with some other big projects. So, um, and that was a big part of the Do Better Bill and that sort of thing, which, you know, with any Metro, which that's not this, but you're reporting back to Metro on those. And let me chime in just to clarify on that. So Amazon, was, and this is not Metro Incentive, but Amazon was the first company, correct, to... It was Be Alliance, Bernstein, and then, yeah, Amazon. Alliance, Bernstein, and then Amazon. Yes. So they were one of the, they were the first two mm -hmm. to come under the Do Better Bill, which you, which you yes. uh, did a lot of work on and actually came, I think, and spoke before our board about that before you were a board member. It was an ancient history. Ancient yes, history. Long ago, yes. Long ago. <laughs> so thank um, you. So yeah, good, yeah, good points. Thank you. Cool. And so absolutely. Well, good to hear. Um, other comments I had just from some of the other um community engagement, that sort of thing. Um, just the affordable housing uh, fund that you guys are talking about is wonderful. And then it sounds like there's a lot up and coming. Um, I would just encourage, you know, as much as we can get um, affordable housing is such a loose term in the sort of 60% AMI realm and even under, but, you know, I know that just depends on the developers you're working with and that sort of thing. But, you know, if you are helping with the funding, you know, you, you can then push that, hey, we really need more affordable, affordable housing or, you know, highly affordable housing, however you want to describe that term. Um, you know, workforce housing is important as well, 80% to 100% AMI, um, but we need a lot of 60% range as well. And so anything Amazon can do to lead on that, just, you know, I mean, again, if you're giving the grants, I think you have push and, and sway that you can help us get, uh, as Nashville becomes less and less affordable, you know, we need those units. Absolutely. Michelle, want to say yeah. Just really quick to that yeah. point, I probably should have said it earlier, but with the fund and the developers and nonprofits that we're working with, we're looking to stay between that 30 to 80 percent AMI. So directly hitting on the workforce housing um, and lower income housing that we desperately need. So what percent did you say? I'm sorry, 30? 30 to 80. Oh, 30 to yes. 80. Perfect. Yeah, yes, that's yes. absolutely great. And even even 80 to 100 is now considered workforce, I guess, and mm -hmm. uh, depending on where you're reading. But yeah. 30 to 80 is will get us some really good housing stock that we we really need here in Nashville. Um, and you mentioned a lot of the minority contractors. I would also just say, you know, working with labor, um, this is my same spiel that everybody heard at council many times. <laughs> when we work with labor and we get the good jobs on the ground, to me, we want to help minority contractors as well. But to me, what's going to help a lot of minorities is is work good jobs uh, all at all levels. Mm -hmm. And if if we have those those standards, those higher standards. Um, we just help more people all around, um, exactly. you know, so um, just continue to push that. And then final comment I had was on the biking, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. I love the engagement from you guys. As a city, just a comment, we need to um, we need to build more infrastructure for them. I mean, anyway, you guys can help is great if there's mm -hmm. we start making buckets and funds and that sort of thing. 
Um, but we've got to we've got to have an aggressive uh, biking infrastructure, yes. um, you know, plan. And uh, there are plans. We just need to really implement them. So we've got work to do on that. And uh, yeah, we'd love to see people uh, biking down there. You guys are, have added a lot of employees in a in a in a big area downtown. So we need to help you from the city side. Thanks, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Board Member Davis. I'll, I'll go to my right, Board Member Johnson. Any comments or questions for the state and or any other representatives from Amazon? Oh, no. Thank you for being here. Um, I do have a quick question. <coughs> you mentioned minority contracting and working with minority nonprofits. How do you define minority, and do you have um, any uh, statistics or data to, to back up how many people in each subcategory you've worked with? or are you just throwing it out as a general term? Um, for the Housing Equity Fund? For the Housing Equity Fund, and you mentioned uh, minority contractors as well? Yes, so for the Housing Equity Fund, we don't have a specific definition um, for minority that I can share, but for us it is people of color. Um, and so we are reaching out to all um, nonprofits of color, all developers that we know, um, just to make sure that they are included in the process and they are able to apply and receive those fundings to build homes. You say you are reaching out or you've already reached out? We've been reaching out since January. So we have reached out mm -hmm. to all council members and they have been making references um, just with the nature of the announcement. A lot of people have found us before we found them. So we've been having great conversations. We're also looking at opportunities to partner with organizations to make sure that we are helping training and support people who want to get in this field who are minorities but who may not have um, the skills or their credentials but just to help them get up and be able to have the credentials necessary to participate as well. So we want to include everyone, but we know that we needed to have some intentionality with it as well for communities of color. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Johnson. Board Member Forrester, any comments or questions for the state or the, rep the, the Amazon team? Uh, yes. So um, just to kind of follow up on the $2 billion housing equity fund. Can you just explain it a little more to us? Um, how much of it is ultimately going to be dedicated to Nashville out of the $2 billion? And exactly how, how does it work? Are you loaning money to developers with the expectation of being paid back? <clears throat> or is there grant money involved? Or how does that work? So with the fund, our goal is to provide below market capital to, develop, to developers and nonprofits. That could be in the form of loans, lines of credits, and grants. And so what we are doing is as we communicate with these different entities who are interested in applying, there is an application process. And so you would submit it and you would say, hey, I have an idea for 100 units that are 60% AMI in this location. And when the team is looking at the project and looking at you know, the developers or the nonprofits' backgrounds and finances, they're able to come up with a package that works specifically for them. Um, a lot of the grant funding will likely be steered towards nonprofits just because that's the nature of um, nonprofit work, but there is no specific standard or rubric that we are looking at. We're looking at each project case by case um, because we believe in this instance it requires a level of innovation and uniqueness to come up with some great affordable housing ideas, and we want to make sure that the funding directly lines with that. So we have an internal um, finance team who could probably speak better than I to the specifics on the funding, but um, it's definitely done on a case-by-case -case basis and in communication with the nonprofit entity or the developer. And it has anything been funded yet or is it still not yet so we just opened up our application process last month and so we've sent the application link out to everyone um, and as people apply the team will reach out and we'll do follow-up calls just to make sure we fully understand the project fully understand the community's need because we recognize that we just want to be the resource and the funder and we know that the people who are really who've been doing the work for the longest and are boots on the ground and know the best location and the communities are here, and so we just want to support them. Okay, thank you. And uh, I, I do want to say I, I just really appreciate you guys doing that and stepping up to the plate to make a difference here in Nashville with affordable housing. Thank you. And I'm relatively new to the board, and I did have another question about the, the State of Tennessee capital grant. 
Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was reading the documents, it looked like it's a, a five-year period, and it's to reimburse construction costs on the Nashville Yards project and that you must maintain 5,000 jobs in order to qualify for the grant, right, or the reimbursement. Yeah. So I know this doesn't fall under the Do Better Bill because it's a state grant, but I wondered if Amazon would be willing to share with us. I think I heard somebody say that of that 5,000, you've already hired 2,000. Would you be willing to just share with us about what, those 2,000 individuals look like, you know, uh, as far as, you know, diversity and, and that type of thing? Sure. So Can I, let, me, let me chime in there very quickly. Board Member Forrest, that's a great question. And, and before you answer, let me give you the four that this board has, that's kind of a great segue that we've been intentional about asking. So one is certainly uh, race of employees, uh, two, gender. Uh, three, average salary, and four, county of residents, uh, percentage of residents that live within Davidson County. So if you have that, that would be great for us to speak to. Thank you, Board Member Forrester. Sure. So one just quick clarification. The grant is actually a 10-year grant, so I want to make sure that's accurate, re accurately reflected. So it would be paid out over the course of 10 years as Amazon creates jobs. So we're not going to receive any money from the state of Tennessee until the job creation has occurred. Um, so I just want to make sure that's clear for the board. And then the jobs have to be hired, so the job has to be created and retained um, for that 10-year period. The data that you're asking, I actually don't have with me. I don't have visibility into that today, um, but certainly as part of our obligation to Metro related to the Metro incentives, that information as requested and as part of our reporting obligation will be, re be provided to the board. And I know we have done, Michelle and Courtney, I know there's been a lot of outreach efforts in terms of our hiring and how we're trying to make sure we're making these job opportunities available to all residents that want an opportunity to work at Amazon. So I don't know if one of you want to talk about some of that, like Black and Tech or any of those things we've done. It's good to see you all. I'm Courtney Ross. Um, I think the other Courtney, as we like to say now, um, with Courtney Pogue on board. Um, so I lead our external affairs efforts, um, and I'll just chime in on some of the efforts that we've done in the external affairs as it relates to recruitment of workforce. We're working very closely with TSU. Um, we have a really exciting engagement with them that we announced as the beginning of our, um, when we announced the HQ location here in Nashville of, a, of an endowed computer science professor. We're working very closely with the students of TSU to really get them ready for the Amazon jobs. We're also working closely with all the universities um, in New York, Nashville and the state of Tennessee. We've recently joined, um, well, we're the, the title sponsor for Blacks in Technology. We are with the Women's in Technology, um, of course, with the Nashville Technology Council. And we're um, just making every effort with our, um, with our recruitment staff and with, um, with our internal team to make sure that the job opportunities are reaching minority communities, are reaching um, all, all different walks of life for, um, for our diversity in the Nashville office. Any other questions specifically about those engagements? Thank you for the information. That sounds like you are making a lot of um, efforts to, you know, a fund talented. You, you you have to fund competent and qualified people, but certainly making sure that you're casting your net wider. Uh, that's something that this board has always questioned companies on. If if you're looking at a if you have a narrow search, don't think that you're going to get different results right. in your hiring unless you take initiatives. And it may take a little more work, and uh, you may have to be a little bit more deliberate in the beginning, but it's certainly worth it. That's how you widen that pool. Right. So uh, thank I, you for sharing I did, that. Um, I did. If you don't mind, I neglected sure. to mention kind of the, the long-term pipeline. Um, those are That's kind of our short-term pipeline, pipeline of those students that will be graduating soon, but looking... You know, we're here for the long haul. We're committed to Nashville and the state of Tennessee for the long haul. And we're working very close with Metro Schools. Um, you may be familiar with Amazon Future Engineers, which is in all Metro schools. Um, we're very dedicated to, you know, the pipeline from, you know, from entering Metro Schools all the way through. And we want those opportunities to be available to them as they grow up and as they enter the workforce. And we want to make sure they understand those those opportunities for them as they, um, as they grow. So we're very supportive of Pencil. 
of Dr. Battle and of um, of all the all the advances that Metro schools are making um, and are currently struggling through right now with the pandemic. Sure. No, thank you for sharing that. Great details. Board Member Forster, any other comments or questions? I have right. a comment regarding. Um, just Board Member Allen. Um, as Nashville and Davidson County becomes more diverse and 34% of our Metro students are English language learners, yep. of which 30% are Hispanic, um, reaching out to other minorities mm -hmm. um, will benefit Amazon, I mean, globally yes. um, as we, the minorities are changing. So just so Thank you for, for saying that. Um, we are uh, very supportive of, of course, Conexion and Hispanic Family Heritage, all the Everybody, um, it's one of our priorities as well, and we are supporting this year the English, um, the ESL program at Conexion. So um, that's a great point, and thank you for. And we have really a very large um, Asian community yes. and Indian community. They're not as well representative, yes. but within themselves, they're very strong, and their children are very educated. Yeah. Um, so my recommendation is continue to look at um, other nonprofits that are. Uh, really doing the work yeah. um, because there's a, the, the minority is going to become a majority by the year 2040 according to our census. So thank you. A minority of a new minority. Yes. And board member <laughs> Allen, maybe you can refer some of those, you know, some of those organizations, maybe you can get those over to Courtney and he can yes, send please. those potentially over to Amazon no, that the you're other familiar with. Yes, please. Yes, yes. <laughs> so Metro's going to work with, with the board and identify organizations around Nashville to make sure we have a very diverse population and mm -hmm. work with Amazon from Courtney, Jessica, and Michelle. So this is a partnership, a long-term partnership. Absolutely. And Sounds one more final comment is, yes, um, as we look at Metro Airport does a lot of um, minority um, certification, um, and we know that a lot of them need help in partnering with non-blacks uh, and people of color um, to partner, and that is a great measurable. Um, because some of them can't get the big projects, but they can evolve. Mm -hmm. So I know um, working a lot with Metro airports and trying to get certification, and I'm sure you have those as well as Metro um, uh, government, but um, education and understanding how to be insured and bonded is something that is very new mm -hmm. to our minority communities who are capable, mm -hmm. but they might not be able to handle the project, um, but um, they need to learn. So they might need a hand up there, especially with our growth of, of Nashville. So. So that issue just brought up, we actually working with the Minority Supply Development Council to kind of address that issue. As part of our strategy for economic development, that's something we're going to focus on. We're actually starting the meetings in regards to that with our contractors around the, the, the city and the metro to discuss that issue that's raised. Okay, so Amazon will be part of that, those discussions as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Allen. Uh, Vice Chair Quinn, any comments or, or questions for Amazon? Yeah, thanks for or the state. <laughs> thanks for coming today. I just want to echo some of the other comments about how appreciative I am as a citizen, but also just personally that y'all are encouraging people to ride bikes, walk, and use WeGo. As somebody who uses all those methods of transportation in Midtown on a regular basis, often with like a kid on the bike and two on their own bikes following me. The more people we have using bike lanes, the safer bike lanes are um, for all from our youngest citizens to our oldest. Um, so I really appreciate that. So thank you. Um, I know that you mentioned you're working on getting people back in the office. And so I think a lot of my colleagues have asked a lot of my questions, but I just have one question, which is what efforts are y'all doing to encourage your workforce to get vaccinated? We have really low numbers here in Tennessee, and I think for the safety of everybody, when we talk about bringing large groups together, that's really important. So I'm just wondering sort of what you're doing on a company-wide basis and locally to help encourage that. Absolutely, so we talk about vaccination with our associates. We're not mandating that they be vaccinated, but we are absolutely encouraging that they are. Um, and we've just recently gone back to also wearing masks in our fulfillment center so that, and then also in our, our offices as well, but making sure we're doing everything we can as a company to keep our associates safe is certainly our number one priority. At one point during the pandemic, we were offering testing and vaccinations within our fulfillment centers. Um, so now that vaccinations have become more readily available, they're not necessarily in the fulfillment centers anymore, but we did do that in the height of the pandemic when we were having, you know, people were having a hard time accessing them. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Quinn. Well, last question I have just from a real estate perspective, 
can you speak to just generally speaking? You all are lease. Uh, we I talked a little bit about your recently signing the lease for your second tower. Can you kind of speak to duration of that? Obviously, that's a very long term lease due to the significant investment that you're that you're making for those those properties. They look really great from a architectural standpoint, and certainly it sounds like you're. Uh, making some measures, even though you don't necessarily get elite certification, you're certainly incorporating those into your building, which certainly adds cost as well. So if you can kind of speak to that high level, that would be fantastic. So you just wanted to talk to Lloyd, I'm assuming. You didn't want him to have traveled here and not get to talk to you guys. So <laughs> I will let <laughs> Lloyd speak to sort of the terms around the, the specific, you know, real estate terms around the lease, if you have them. <laughs> I, I, I don't, but I think I can talk around it. Sure, uh, just a high, high level. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lloyd Chi. I'm Senior Corporate Counsel within the Legal Department at Amazon. I uh, just wanted to start off by saying that I have the great pleasure of joining you all today. Uh, I was a part of the original HQ2 search team, so I have visited your fair city a number of times and very happy to be here today. Uh, regarding the commercial terms and the term length of the uh, lease that we just signed, I don't have that right now offhand. More than happy to confer with my colleagues in the real estate legal department to provide that information to you here shortly. We do, as you alluded to, think long term, and we are making a long term commitment in Nashville, so I can assure you that the term length is a sufficient amount for us to continue to grow in your city. That sounds good. I, thank you. And, and last question, uh, at least on, on my end, obviously you have not started the clock on the Metro incentive, and again, that's not what we're here for today, but since you're before us, do you have any thoughts or anything on when you think you may start that clock for the Metro incentive grant that yeah, you want to share today? Uh, we don't and do not have a final decision on the timing. We will certainly do so in concert and in consultation with Metro. Uh, as you know, when the resolution was passed, there was some thought given to the length of the uh, time in which we could avail ourselves of the benefit. And we wanted to make sure that we do so, so that it does not negatively impact Metro budget. We certainly plan on going forward with that sentiment. That makes sense. Well, thank you for, thank you for sharing. And I would just say we're, I'm, I'm so delighted. Obviously a lot of our questions today, not all of them were related specifically to the, the state, the state capital grant. But I do thank you for, for one, bringing a team of, of people here to thoroughly answer our questions. It's very clear, as you can tell from the questions and comments from this board, that you know we're very intentionally wanting to um, address some of the issues that, that, that affect our, our city and, and, and people we know and our neighbors and family. And, and one of those is certainly the affordable housing. Uh, Nashville continues to grow, which is there's a great, that's the good part, but the downside is it's, I mean, it's just very expensive to live here in. And I like the fact that you also talked about sometimes when we think about affordable housing, we only think about, you know, the, the low income, but also if you're, you know, workforce housing, if you're a school teacher, if, um, if you're an emergency responder, if you're a police officer, uh, you know, what we typically call our workforce housing, it's challenging for those folks as well, just due to the cost. So I appreciate your thorough responses on that, um, and and certainly on a personal level with with you being downtown. And and I'll just share this, and I'll, I'll stop. I went to high school downtown many years ago. When I went to high school downtown, there were not there was not that much to do, which is probably good for me. So uh, I had to stay in school. I, I don't know what I would do now because there's a lot going on in downtown all the time, no matter the day, no matter the time. But what has changed about Nashville, which I think is important to consider with your company, is at the time nobody lived downtown. There were not, there were not, there was no Germantown either. There, was, there were not a lot of people that lived there. So now, at least the good thing that we have with the growth is there are a lot more units in a close proximity to your new office. So hopefully, there will be quite a few people too that are living in close proximity, uh, which also will improve transportation. And obviously, the average salaries that you announced for your employees uh, will lend itself to be able people that can afford to live um, in higher in, in higher cost neighborhoods closer to the city. So, I think that's all positive. So, anyway, I thank you all again for for answering our, our questions, and we look forward to you coming before us uh, again at, with updates 
at some point down the line. So thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to continuing to collaborate and partner with you. Thank you all. Uh, with that, let me uh, turn it over to Bob. Bob, if we got these documents that we're approving today, um, but if you will just kind of high level speak speak to speak to what we're doing related to the state pass through and obviously this is not coming out of metro's budgets of pass through but if you will high level speak to those and then we'll certainly give the board an opportunity to ask, to ask any questions of you uh, before we move for a, a vote on approving these documents Won't you switch with me? No, we can't hear you. Won't you switch with me real quickly? Just switch with me. All right. Thank you. This is a big deal. Get to sit where the chair sits. Don't get too comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'm Bob Took. I'm outside general counsel to the Industrial Development Board. And... Um, I'm so grateful to get to work with Margaret Darby, who's from Metro Legal and who's been doing this kind of work for so many years and tolerating me for those many years too. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I, and also I wanna re-apologize for being a little tardy this morning. Um, my favorite shortcut was literally cut off and it was a divided road and there wasn't a solution. It was hilarious. Well, no, not hilarious, frustrating. Uh, but the good news is that's part of the development that's going on in Nashville. And I know a whole lot of us are very, very grateful as you've just heard from this board for Amazon's efforts. And um, in addition, the matter that's on the agenda that the chair mentioned, um, is this uh, matter involving the existing affordable housing project that's going on uh, on Dickerson Pike. Okay, we, we come back to the Amazon grant. Sorry, give us one second. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought I was going to start talking about the uh, uh, affordable housing uh, on Dickerson Pike, but instead the chair, I think quite properly, wants to uh, take the actions that are set forth on the agenda. Um, if you look under new business, uh, you will see um, approval of State of Tennessee capital grant of $65 million for the benefit of Amazon Services, LLC, and uh, uh, those are the matters that you've been hearing the uh, testimony about. And so then the question is, is the board ready? And I'll wait for the chair to come back to his place um, to take these matters up and, uh, and approve the uh, documents that were provided. And I'm turning this back over to the chair. Thank you. It reminds me of musical chairs. So, uh, thank you for thank you for that, and thank you all for your patience. We, we've got some technical issues up here, and I will also turn it over to Margaret. If Margaret, if you will speak to high level again, the three documents uh, that were on under Section Five related to the capital grant for Amazon, Absolutely. and then we'll go from there and we'll let the board ask you any questions if they have any specifically on those documents. Certainly. Um, the, this grant is similar to a fast track grant um, that this board has seen in the past. There are three documents. The first document is a grant agreement between the state and the Industrial Development Board 
for uh, the $65 million. Um, and this is the document that contains um, a lot of the obligations for the uh, construction at the, at the facility location. The second agreement is a grant agreement between the Industrial Development Board and Amazon, where we pass along all of those obligations to Amazon to meet um, from the first agreement. The third agreement is a three-party agreement between Amazon, the state, and the Industrial Development Board. This one is uh, the jobs metrics portion of the, um, of the entire grant deal. And the, these are all, this is the structure, aside from the agreement between the state and the IDB being with the state architect's office and being overseen by them, this is um, pretty much identical to your, uh, your fast track grant that you've seen before. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. Uh, Board Member Allen, any questions for Margaret specifically related to these documents? All right, Board Member Davis. All right, Board Member Johnson, Board Member Forrester, Vice Chair Quinn. Oh, I'm sorry, I keep saying that. I'm going to say Vice Chair Sagal, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's also my recommendation um, that there are three different agreements and you should vote on them separately. That's what my next question was. So, okay, we cannot do them as a package. That's, that's your legal recommendation. That is my recommendation, correct. All right. Y'all, I've learned you listen to your legal counsel. That's a good <laughs> thing. So we'll, we'll do that. So, Margaret, sorry. Oh, sorry, question. Any particular order so that they make sense? Uh, I, no, I think that if you just go one, two, three, that would be fine. All right. That sounds good. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, related to... Uh, Item one, grant agreement between State of Tennessee and Industrial Development Board uh, related to the capital grant of $65 million for the benefit of Amazon Services, LLC. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right. There is a motion on the table by Board Member Allen. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Seconded by Board Member Davis. Any discussion? All right. Let's move for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. All those opposed? All right. So motion carried. Thank you. Let's move on to item number two, grant agreement between Industrial Development Board and Amazon Services, LLC. Is there a motion on the table? So moved. All right. There is a motion on the Second. floor by Board Member Allen, second by Board Member Davis. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. All those opposed? All right. So that so moved and approved. Thank you. Item number three, accountability agreement between State of Tennessee, Amazon Services LLC, and Industrial Development Board. Do we have a motion on the floor? Second. All right. So I've got a motion from Vice Chair Segal. Do we have a second? Second. All right, seconded by Board Member Davis. Any discussion? All right, we will move to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, all those, any opposed? All right, motion carried. I thank you all for, for your efforts in working through three of those items. And again, thank you, Amazon, so we appreciate it. Uh, we'll, we will continue and move on to item number B which is approval of the State of Tennessee ECD Accountability Agreement Amendments for Alliance Bernstein, Cinemax, and QTC. Um, is there anyone from the state here to, Lindy, back with us again? All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is just simply for, for all three of these companies, a one-year extension to the accountability agreement between the state and the company. Um, due to COVID-19. And so in the state accountability agreement for any company receiving incentive dollars from us, the force majeure clause did not cover a pandemic. And so because of that, our the state along with the governor and our uh, executive team came together to see what we could offer our co companies that currently had a grant incentive with the state 
in order to help alleviate that period of time that still seems to be going on due to COVID and the pandemic. But we decided to offer a one-year extension to any company that currently has a grant incentive through our office. And so um, this is a grant offer that you guys have already voted on and approved in the past. This is just simply a one-year extension to the accountability agreement. The contract itself does not change. The language does not change. It's a one-year extension. We will definitely be having more of these. You will be seeing more of these come through. Um, and so just as a heads up, this is what this is. And we're going on a company by company basis asking if they want the one-year extension, if they elect yes, that's when we come back to you guys for approval. Understood. And just to clarify, can you speak to again, understand with the pandemic, but why is the agreement, are you amending it just because of the pandemic was not included or are you also extending it for a year as well? Just to. No, clarify. it's, it's. Companies said in that one year period, a lot of companies said in that one year period that they weren't able to continue to hire the same amount of jobs okay. that they expected. And so it was us, the state coming together and saying, what can we do to perhaps, we don't want to get to a point where we have to start clawing back money because of the pandemic, because they were a year short on their job creation. And so it is our plan to offer that one year extension to meet their job numbers so that we give them kind of that one year grace period to fulfill their obligations and their accountability agreement. Sure. That, that makes sense. And, and certainly, uh, who could have, who would have known, um, that we see this and certainly I would think there's I'm, obviously there's still a lot of challenges in the yes. labor force as well, quite yes. frankly. Uh, so makes total sense to me. Can you, can you give us, and, and obviously several of these companies have been before us, Alliance Bernstein has had representatives come before us on several occasions. Uh, can you also speak to just high level, give the board just a quick background on maybe each company? Um, obviously Alliance Bernstein just uh, opened their offices there uh, at the uh, former convention center uh, next to the National African American Museum of art so great great area but can you speak to just high level each company kind of I background don't have my notes on me so okay. forgive me I was I was prepared to answer the structural questions of oh this. you see we ask everything I here. know I know um Courtney I don't know if you have anything in your notes no at this time you know just really about the extension yeah. I mean Okay. In the ECB world around the country, pretty much every state and every city is doing these one-year extensions because of the pandemic. No one foresaw a pandemic of this scale and the impact upon our incentive agreement. So we're just kind of following the lead of other states and other yeah. cities around the country. All right. Thank and they, you and they came that. to us, a lot of them came to us asking if they can enact the force majeure clause in a contract. And unfortunately, ours does not cover a pandemic. So we needed to make wave for a way for them to be able to meet their obligations during such a trying time. All right. That makes sense. I will check with our board. I'll start with board member Allen. Any questions or no. comments related no. to these? Board member Davis. All right. Thank you, board member Johnson. Board member Forrester. All right, Vice Chair Segal. Um, Just to comment to all three agreements, I think we have uh, Ginger and on some of these, her personal email and phone number down for notices. And I think that probably needs to be corrected. I guess a question for Margaret is, is there a better email and phone number we can use for the notice provisions in our agreement as yes. opposed to, say, the chair's email so yes. that legal actually gets those notices? We are, we, we, I have sent information to the state asking for the changes to be made to the documents. I believe that those were sent back yes, um, yes, a day or two ago, yes. so they just haven't been uploaded to the SharePoint file yet. Um, but we have changed the notice um, to be the uh, executive director for, uh, it, it essentially will be Courtney, but it doesn't, it says care of, of director for the Office of Economic and Community Development. All right, thanks. So. That's my only comment. Thank you for pointing that out, Vice Chair Segal. Uh, Margaret, from your end, is there anything to add that you have to add related to this? I don't. I've looked over the amendments. It's similar to the Warby Parker um, amendment that we did a couple of months ago, a couple of meetings ago. Um, again, I would recommend that you take these up individually for sure. approval. All right. Bob, anything for us on this one? All right. 
I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. So related to item number under new business, item number B, approval of the State of Tennessee ECD Accountability Agreement Amendments, item number one, Alliance Bernstein. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right, so we have a motion on the floor by Board Member Allen, seconded by Board Member Davis. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Any opposed? All right, motion carried. Thank you. Item number two, uh, approval of State of Tennessee ECD Accountability Agreement Amendments for Cinemax. Do we have a motion? So moved. All right, motion on the table by Board Member Allen. Do we have a second? All right, second it by Vice Chair Segal. Thank you. Any discussion? All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? All right, motion carried, thank you. Same thing for uh, approval of State of Tennessee ECD Account B Agreement Amendments for QTC. We have a motion on the floor. So moved. All right, thank you, Board Member Allen. Do we have a second? Second. All right, thank you, Board Member Johnson. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. All those opposed? All right, thank you, motion carry. All right, well, thank you for, thank you, Lindy, and we uh, it's totally make sense on on the need for that, and um, hopefully things will get better and, and um, these companies can get back on track with, with hiring. So we thank you for joining us today and answering all of our questions. All right, with that, let's move to item number C. Under new business, uh, presentation by grantees of annual performance and approval of annual incentive grantee payments for calendar year in December 31st, 2020. Uh, make a quick note on this that uh, we will not be discussing Dell today. Uh, so we will, that will come off the agenda today. So the three companies will be discussing HGA, Bridgestone and Phillips. And again, just big picture here, these are metro incentives that have already, the actual grants have already been approved. These companies are coming before us today for the annual approval of the grants incentive. Um, again, these, this is based on the number of jobs as of December 31st, 2020. And as Council Member Toome stated, uh, those allocations have been included in the fiscal year 2022 budget. And uh, just in case anyone was a little confused on it, at least I was, the difference in years. Uh, reminder, Metro's fiscal year runs from July 1 of 2021 through June 30th of 2022. So that's why it's called fiscal year 2022. Uh, with that said, I think we have representatives from, do we have any representatives from HCA, Courtney? Uh, yes, they are here. Okay. Uh, do you want to? Do you have anything you want to share on these or HCA before we uh, have their representatives come up and talk to us? Sure, I'll give a quick overview, but I'm sure to give more details. In sure. To the Thank you. Grant, and so the HCA uh, Capital View Grant was basically for the Charlotte and Eleventh Avenue uh, building, which is basically 570,000 square feet. Uh, One Dale Parkway was 120,000 square uh, feet and 2,000 American General Way, which is 300,000 square feet. It's a seven-year grant, which the first year was 2018, and the last year will be 2024, with the final payment in fiscal year 26. Uh, the grant covers $500 incremental company and entity pay positions as of 12:31 of any grant year, and the fiscal year 22 appropriations $1,234,500. So with that being said, I encourage the uh, individuals from HCA and their representative to come up. Thank you for that, Courtney. Hello, everyone. And um, let me first say that I'm thrilled to be in front of 
a live audience, if you will. So, <laughs> uh, My name is Scott Rayson. I am a partner at Waller Lanston uh, here in Nashville. And uh, this is, this is uh, Debbie Chastain, who is uh, in charge of the uh, economic uh, development programs for HCA's projects all over the, the country. Uh, let me just give a little information first, and then, uh, you know, obviously we'll turn it over to questions, and, and then I think Debbie may be the, the better person to answer those. So, um, well, as Courtney said, uh, this, uh, the, the HCA grant agreement covers three facilities, uh, the original facility being the, uh, the Capitol View Tower uh, over on Charlotte near um, I-40. If you've missed it, it's the tall one that has HCA uh, up at the top. Uh, and then uh, after the, the grant agreement was approved, initially uh, two other facilities were added uh, to the grant agreement. Uh, the, the facility on Old Hickory Boulevard, or just off Old Hickory Boulevard, is the old uh, AIG headquarters. Um, and, the, uh, and the third facility, which is at uh, One Dell Way, is the, um, the office building that Dell built um, out by the airport when it planned to develop an enormous campus before the whole world of economics of small computers and laptops changed. So, but, um, and, and just one note, uh, well, by the way, we call the old AIG facility Health Park, and we call the old Dell building uh, Sky Park. And uh, just a short note about Sky Park is that uh, about the time that was added to this grant agreement is the time when HCA made its final decision to completely renovate the existing headquarters facility over by Centennial Park. And that's headquarters, it's where ITNS uh, information is. It's, it's an enormous uh, number of square feet and several buildings. And in order to do that renovation, they basically had to do it on a space-by-space -space basis. So, for example, they would take um, the, the headquarters buildings or, um, you know, there's an east side and a west side with a connector. So they would do the east side. And in order to house those employees while the renovation of the east side was being done, they used Sky Park. And so it's been a... Sky Park has been used as sort of a rolling uh, headquarters or, or location for nomads uh, as the facility has been developed. And, and because of that, uh, there, there are no people located at Sky Park in, uh, in the submission that HCA has made for the grant uh, payment before you today. And, um, and it has never included any Sky Park employees. Uh, it, there are qualified employees there. We just didn't think, HCA didn't think, that, is, that that's in the spirit of what was negotiated in the grant agreement uh, when Sky Park was added. The, the, the use of the facility changed dramatically shortly after that. That's all I need to say about that. So, uh, turning to the other facilities, uh, Capital View, um, uh, you know, obviously we've talked about the location. Uh, that facility, uh, the office tower, is used uh, for the headquarters of three uh, major uh, HCA subsidiaries, or really uh, three different branches of operations. One is... Um, called uh, Health Trust, and their main function is to operate what's called a group purchasing organization, which in healthcare parlance is, is a, a, a regulatory compliant way of having a single purchasing group for 
hundreds of hospitals, not just HCA hospitals. Um, and then it's the headquarters for uh, Paralon, which is another centralized uh, service uh, uh, wing of HCA, and they provide uh, services to all HCA hospitals and a lot of other hospitals, a lot of other hospitals. And then the third is uh, the Sarah Cannon uh, Cancer Research Wing uh, of the company. Uh, it houses about 2,300 people. Uh, the investment for the tower was uh, uh, over $200 million, and, um, and they also uh, built, shortly after the tower was completed, a multi-million dollar standalone uh, daycare center, which is in a separate building, but, uh, you know, just feet or yard, uh, 100 yards or something from the tower itself. Um, then the second health park, the old AIG headquarters, um, acquired in 2014, and um, an HCA did a $70 million renovation on that. Uh, it now um, houses approximately 1,300 employees, and I believe most of those are with the Physicians Services Group. Um, so the, the uh, submission for this year's grant payment um, is, uh, the, the amount of the payment is uh, $1,234,500. Uh, this is the uh, fifth of the seven payments, seven, year five of, year, of seven years. And uh, the payment amount is based on uh, 2,469 incremental qualified jobs. You know, the, the, these agreements, you, you take the base number of jobs uh, that existed before the grant agreement, you exclude them, and so the grant is based on new qualified jobs. Uh, and so of those jobs, um, about 1,600 are uh, at Capital View, and about uh, 800 are at Health Park. Um, so then, uh, demographic information. Um, first is demographic information uh, based on gender, and 57% um, of the employees at these facilities are female, 43% male. Um, demographics based on race, and if you'll indulge me, and Debbie and I have not discussed this, but, um, us, and this is, this is just me, uh, because I think this is an important thing that I believe, and that, and I think this is a, a form that's appropriate for this, particularly since we're talking about demographics. And, that is, uh, I think we were asked to provide demographics based on race, and, um, and I personally believe that race is a misnomer because, you know, culturally, we talk about race and the races, and we do it in so many ways, and we've done it for decades and decades, if not centuries. And, you know, think about the terminology that was used as race became the customary way to describe things. But really, and maybe this is just science, we're all part of the same race. We're all homo sapiens. We're all members of the human race, and we're all human beings. So apologize for the digression, but you know, this, this is, this is, you know, this is being talked about more and more, so I just needed to share that and, again. Um, okay, so, but, uh, so minority demographics, 20% uh, of the employees are uh, African American, Asian, Hispanic, uh, Latino, or uh, people of um, heritages uh, other than, than uh, whites, people of, other people of color. Um, so. Uh, and then demographics based on county of residence, 
37% of all the employees at these facilities reside in Davidson County, but I do want to share one uh, percentage that we think is very telling, and that's 43% of the qualified jobs, the incremental jobs, 43% reside in Davidson County. And so these, these were headquarters, these facilities headquartered operations in Williamson County before, yep. now Davidson County. So if you think about the incremental jobs, a significantly higher percentage of people are in Davidson County, and that's clearly because of location. Um, last, uh, uh, last item is the average compensation. And I believe you mentioned this. Uh, it's uh, uh, for, for all the jobs. It's $99,900 uh, average compensation. And, but very important, that amount does not include uh, the employee benefits, employee benefit costs, which are, um, you know, that's a significant amount for all the employees. And with that, I turn it over to the board and to Debbie. Thank you. Just want to see if you had any specific questions. Debbie, if you want to introduce yourself too, and just and if there's any other information you want to share, and then I'll open it to to my colleagues for questions for both of you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I'm Debbie Chastain, and I'm with HCA, and I uh, I manage the economic development for HCA across HCA's portfolio. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say I'm. Uh, Thank you for providing these statistics. Again, obviously, this you all did not come before the Do Better Bill, and uh, but we certainly appreciate you providing it. Again, as I shared before, this board has been very intentional about uh, since I started a couple around the time when I started on the board. You know, we kind of led this initiative, and and the reason we ask these questions, quite frankly, is 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 from the standpoint that hey, you're getting money from taxpayers. Everybody is paying into this. It's Metro taxpayer money, um, and this board certainly you know wants to see that across everybody that everybody is is growing in that. So I, thank you for sharing that. I will say this about your you're welcome your Capital View project. I don't know. Yeah, I think it just board member Allen and I, and maybe. And, board, and Vice Chair Sagal, we were actually able to have a meeting yes. at your Capital View facility um, several years ago. Um, I remember it was winter time, it was pretty cold, but your facility there is absolutely state of the art. Um, and when you think about that area there on Charlotte, uh, that Capital View area, it has really changed. And, and certainly you all were kind of the catalyst for that. Um, and now you've got all the restaurants over there, uh, the banks, the publics that opened, I think, about two years ago. Um, so that area has really been transformed. So uh, great location. And, and to your point, when you talk about the the, the incremental jobs, 40 percent of 43 percent of of the qualified positions reside in Davidson County. I think a lot of that speaks to the fact of where you're located. You're located in the core. There's a lot more opportunities now than there were ten, even 10 years ago for people that want to live in the core. You're located on a major corridor, Charlotte, and you're right by the interstate. So just a phenomenal location um, around a lot of multifamily. So so thank you for sharing that. I will turn it over to our my colleagues now if they have any specific questions for you. Uh, board member Johnson, any questions or comments for HCA? Come back to me, Nigel. <laughs> Can do. Board member Forrester. And, and I apologize, but I did not hear all of the statistics. Uh, I, I got the part about the residents in Davidson County, but I did not hear the statistics about race. I okay. think it was 20% minority, correct? That is correct. And 57% uh, female. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. 
Board Member Forster, any other questions or comments? All right, thank you. Board Member Allen, Board Member Davis, Vice Chair Sagal. Uh, no. Okay. Board Member Johnson, anything on your end now? All right. Well, thank well, thank you all for for coming before us, uh, Margaret. From uh, just to clarify for the board members again, the HCA has submitted documentation um, to Metro, which has been audited, correct? For, uh, related to the grant for the jobs for the, this year's allocation. Yeah, the documentation has been submitted and reviewed by the finance department. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Anything else that we need to relevant for us to consider before we take this up? Uh, I, I do not believe so. I just recommend a, a vote to take action to make the grant. All right. Thank you. All right. So regarding the annual performance and approval of, a, of annual incentive for HCA, grantee payment for calendar year in December 31st, 2020. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. All right, thank you, Board Member Allen. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. All right, second by Board Member Davis. Any discussion? All right, let's go to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, let, let me make sure. Let's just do a roll call vote very quickly because I, I didn't hear everybody. I don't know. Board Member Allen? Aye. Board Member Davis? Aye. Board Member Johnson? Aye. Board Member Forster? Aye. Vice Chair Segal? Aye. All right, thank you. Motion carried. All right, thank you all again for coming before us. Uh, let's move to the next item, Bridgestone. Courtney, if you want to give us a quick overview, and I think we have some folks from Bridgestone here today as well. Yes, you do have some individuals from Bridgestone. So today, it's basically for a grant of payment of three hundred eighty-seven thousand five hundred. It is for the downtown Nashville headquarters at two hundred fourth Avenue South, which is five hundred fourteen thousand square feet, and for the project expansion at five twenty five two four four Hickory Hollow Parkway, which is seventy-seven thousand two hundred eighteen square feet. Uh, the grant term is seven years. First grant payment was 2018. The last grant year payment be, will be 2024 with final payment in 2026. And this is for $500 per new job created for each fiscal year in the 1231 of each fiscal year. With that, I'll turn it over to the um, Richstone people. Hi. Um, Hello, good morning. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. I couldn't hear where that was coming from. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman and Board, uh, thank you so much. My name is Caroline Creason. I am Senior Counsel with um, the Corporate Services Group with Bridgestone's Law Department. And um, here, along with Susie Long, who is Vice President of Talent, Diversity, and Culture for Bridgestone, um, our application, we're in year three, of our seven-year agreement. Um, our application was timely submitted to you all, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. Um, I am going to pass it along to Susie, though, for the specifics on um, I know demographics and, and all those sorts of questions. So thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to come here and answer your questions and represent Bridgestone. So looking forward to the conversation this morning. Well, well, first off, I guess, if, if you, since you're over diversity, uh, it sounds like, uh, could you give us the statistics to start off, please? Yeah, absolutely. So within our Bridgestone Tower um, or the Nashville, um, uh, Nashville teammate population, we are currently um, working aggressively on our teammate representation. So we are happy to say that we have accelerated our teammate representation to 22% female with a large percentage of that um, starting to uh, show up in our leadership group. So we've got 26% of our leadership is female. In addition to, and how we define diversity is a little bit more broad. So we have female diversity. Um, African American, people of color, um, Asian, Hispanic. Um, we also include our LGBTQ community 
um, within that definition of diverse. So um, our statistics currently to date, we have approximately um, in our leadership ranks, we've got 26 percent of our re, uh, leadership is is uh, female diverse, and 20 percent is all other aspects of diversity. Within our director ranks, we've got approximately of the population, 28% uh, of that population is um, is female, and then 15% is racially diverse as well. Can you? And, I'm sorry. Can you slow down for some? Sure. Minute? Sorry. So 28% um, of your director roles, you say, is uh, female. Is exactly. that right? Correct. Okay. And then keep going from there, yep. sorry. And then when you get into our professional or frontline teammate, um, they we have 702 teammates within that population. 47% of that population is female, and 17% is racially diverse. And what about your racial diversity for your director? What's the percentage on the, I, I think it was 28% female? 15%. Okay which that is a dramatic improvement um, over prior years. Um, and we're continuing to focus on improving that diversity as well now that we have a dedicated diversity office. Sure, and what about county of residence and average salary? Um, I don't have the county of residence, um, but we have primarily the average salary is trending at above 100,000 at this point. And we're continuing to evaluate that on an annual basis given inflation. Thank you. And is that something that you would, that, do you keep up with county of residence? Is that something that you could pull for us? Yeah. Yes, I believe so. Okay. If you wouldn't mind just following up with and getting that over to Courtney, that would be great. Looking at my legal counsel. <laughs> and big, just big picture. So um, again, several of us who were on the board, we were able to uh, go, and I was one of those, we were able to attend the grand opening. Obviously the world was a different place, but that was just a phenomenal uh, event that you had there at, at your at your office downtown and uh, several of us we then later had a board meeting I, I want to say several months later uh, there and, and again your office is absolutely state-of-the-art and we got to tour the workout room in the cafeteria I said man I'd love to work here it's very know, very it's a beautiful building we love it it's beautiful uh, it's outstanding where so where are you one of the things that was that was dear and personal to me is I, I'm from Nashville I grew up in the Hickory Hollow, um, I still call it Hickory Hollow. Yeah, but, me too. I grew um, up in Nashville too. I grew up over there. I had my first job at Cinnabon. So one of the things I was very excited about was the the uh, operations that you took over there at the mall on the, one of the uh, outbuildings because that really helped also drive some of the restaurants coming back, having that dedicated workforce there and having Nashville State there. You know, it, it, it helped bring the retail back to, to what it was you know, years ago, obviously COVID has kind of changed that. And I read yes. that you all had, there's some changes there. So if you can speak to, you know, how, how your company has been affected for, by that, with that space there that you had in Hickory Hollow. And then, you know, what are your office policies now? Are you open? You know, where are you at capacity? When do you think you, you'll get back? Yes, no, perfect. Great question. So obviously, um, the, no one anticipated the pandemic, um, as you mentioned, and very similarly to, I think, what Amazon stated in terms of their office environment. We are obviously following CDC guidelines, taking all of the safety precautions. We have not closed our office. We still have it open. Um, so we are monitoring capacity on a regular basis. So teammates are welcome to come to the office as long as they follow their um, the safety guidelines of wearing a mask. We're doing temperature checks, et cetera. In regards to um, Hickory Hollow, culture is extremely important to us. And I think we were very intentional when we moved all of the different office locations from Indianapolis and Chicago to Nashville specifically. And having um, everybody under one roof um, became even more critical as we, as we even had them separated in the two different areas. So for us, it's a lot of the, just the culture driver um, in addition to uh, the, the, the flexible work arrangements that were directed arrived from the pandemic, we believed we could get everyone under one roof. Um, and so it was really driven from a couple of different areas. So the pandemic obviously was a catalyst that no one expected, but I think culturally speaking, having everybody in one roof helps with collaboration, innovation, um, a lot of the same principles that Amazon alluded to. And I know that's very important to our 
our CEO, as well as to make sure that teammates feel like they're part of a larger community. So bringing everyone together in the downtown office became even more important. We have not um, said, we have not slowed down our back to work. We've just basically said we want to start seeing people come to the office and demonstrate that it is a safe place to work. We have great cleaning crews, et cetera. So we're starting, I was there this Monday for um, one of our executive meetings, as a matter of fact, and you're starting to see more people come to the office as back to school. Now kids are back to school. Um, so we have basically said, if you feel safe, you can come to the office. If you want to stay and work from home, that's fine. But we do want to encourage everyone to get back to the office definitely by January of 2022. Okay. That makes sense. And what do you plan to do with the space there, I guess, in Hickory Hollow for now? Um, I think that is still under uh, discussion at this point. I don't know, James, if you've got any comment on that. Maybe, I guess, subletting for the duration uh, of your current term. James Weaver Waller, Lanston Council for Bridgestone. That's a, a, a leased facility. Yep. And uh, it's still under lease. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's still being that, that that's still being evaluated. I don't believe there are any employees there at the moment. We're okay. Um, so that's TBD. Understood, and and maybe a potential subletting. Fastest growing, fastest growing part of the city is absolutely. You, as I know, uh, as I know, you know, so much great stuff going on in in the Antioch uh, Hickory Hollow. I still call it Hickory. I Hollow. I can't too. get up the. You know, I it'll just, always be Hickory. It's Hollow always Hickory Hollow to me. Uh, the CBL folks appreciate uh, that. I assure you, that's a good name. Uh, with everything going on across the interstate, sure. Uh, at Century Farms, it's a booming area. So I'm. Confident the space will be utilized, just whether or not it's utilized by BSAM or not, it's TBD. Understood. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. All right, well, I'll turn it over to my colleagues if they have any questions or comments for, for you. We'll start over here. All right, anything on, on the right side? All right. Um, Vice Chair Segal, any questions or comments? I would just ask that the record reflect that I've abstained from this discussion and vote because of a conflict. All right, thank you. Make sure we make note of that. Thank you, Vice Chair Segal. All right, so as it pertains to the, uh, the annual performance and approval of the incentive for Bridgestone for calendar year ending December 31st, 2020, uh, do we have a motion? So moved. All right. Thank second. you. Second. So we have a second. Uh, any discussion? All right. Let's move to vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Um, please make note again that uh, we do have one extension from Vice Chair Segal. So. All right. Well, thank, thank you all. You. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. On to the final item under this section. We have Phillips. I think we have some representatives. Uh, Courtney, if you want to give us just a quick overview on this one as well, and then uh, we'll hear from the representatives of Phillips. Absolutely. So you have Phillips uh, Center of Expertise. It's a uh, seven-year grant. First grant year was 2019. The last grant year will be 2025 with final payment in 2027. And this is for $500 per job, over 500 employees. The total appropriation for fiscal year 2022 is $383,000. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Phillips representative. And if you could just give us, and you have been before us before, but sorry, we have some new members. If you can just give us a quick overview of your company, what you do, where you're located, and, and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, and Ms. Darby and Mr. Toot. Good to see you again as well. Uh, my name is Brad Lampley from the firm of Adams & Reese. I'm a outside counsel for Phillips. I'm joined today by Steve Power, who is our Global Businesses Services Hub Lead of Phillips North America. So we'll be, uh, a lot of the, the questions will be uh, best put to Steve, and he's got a sort of a high-level summary about their operations here. I just wanted to very, very briefly, and I realize that we're we're where we are in the agenda, so I want to I want to be quick, but just give you just a 30 second perspective on Phillips and what they've done. Back in August of 2017, Phillips uh, made the decision to select Nashville over the city of Atlanta for the location of their new global business services hub. And it, I think it's important to realize that you know Phillips prides itself on being one of the first big major corporate relocations to uh, 
to the to the state of Tennessee. And Atlanta probably had a little bit of a of an edge in that since the hockey arena in downtown Atlanta was Phillips Arena at the time. But yet, uh, I was really really proud to see that uh, that they chose Nashville. And I think you know immediately uh, there was a, a big jobs amount announcement said we're going to ramp up to close to 800 jobs and going to do it very quickly. And Phillips has delivered on that. Uh, within 16 months of even making the announcement, they were already up to 700 plus jobs in downtown Nashville, and Steve will, will, will flesh that out a little bit more. But as those of you who are, are frequently in downtown will notice, they have basically they started out in the city center, uh, but, but Phillips has transformed the Bank of America Plaza, the old Bank of America building, which was pretty empty at the time, as you'll remember, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and now between Phillips and Smile Direct Club, I'm proud to say Phillips Plaza is a vibrant part of downtown and has, has really uh, energized that entire block of downtown. Uh, you know, Phillips has got a real success story and uh, we're, we're very proud to share it. And then also I think as, as Steve will explain, has also been proud to become a very, very vital member of the Nashville business community and, and doing a lot of important things throughout uh, the city of Nashville. So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve Power. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and give some details. Good morning. Thank here. you. Um, so let, let me give you the specifics first around what we do in our Phillips Plaza. Um, generally speaking, this is a hub for our global business services for North America. So personally, I'm accountable for all of the uh, delivery of operational execution for the whole North American business, which in itself is close to half the size of Phillips globally, so very important part of our business. Um, within Nashville, we do many things. Uh, all of the people services are run from Nashville, all of the order processing and invoicing, all of the service management contracts, entitlement. Um, we do all of our technical drawing here, so very highly skilled people who are, who are helping to design the hospital rooms where we, where we install all the major imaging machines, things of that nature. Um, and we're expanding into uh, call center and sales as well. So uh, that's been a recent development. We've been adding new types of capabilities into the center, really trying to consolidate some of our inside sales. And I think that's a great opportunity for us moving forward. Um, in terms of some of the numbers that you had asked us to provide, um, we really have a lot of focus on diversity, I think. Uh, from, a, uh, from a gender perspective, 59% of the population from our working population is female. Personally, I look at it, do we have a, an equivalent share of the population to our employee base, to our leadership? And, and uh, actually, I'm proud to say, our, if you look at our leadership, my personal leadership team, it's close to 80% female. So we're, the, the further up you go, 80%, yeah, something like eight out of 10 members of my leadership team. Um, for uh, race breakdown, let me make sure I read this out clearly. Um, we've got quite some breakdown here from the Asian population, excluding Hispanics or Latinos, it's 3%. For black or African-American, again, excluding Hispanics or Latinos, which have their own category, is 29%. Hispanics or Latinos themselves are 3%. Uh, those uh, employees who designate themselves as multiple racial categories are 3%. White is 60% and unknown is 2%. So uh, uh, quite a diverse mix. Um, in terms of the how that, that's for the overall population of employees. In terms of how that goes as you go up the leadership ladder, uh, middle management is around 15% um, non-white, and my team has 10% uh, non-white membership in terms of leadership. Uh, broadly for North America, uh, Phillips has got, announced an initiative to try and drive the director and above level of diversity, not just in Nashville, but actually across the whole company. Mm -hmm. And, and this is one of the initiatives that our America's leadership, excuse me, it's had through the mask. The America's leadership is, uh, is really driving as an active initiative for the company as a whole. Uh, for the county of residence, um, we have 55 people, excuse me, 55% of the people based in Davidson County. Um, Rutherford County has 13%, Williamson 7, Wilson 7. Sumner six, so I'm trying to give you them in order, Montgomery three, Maori two, Dickinson two, Chatham County 2%. So it's uh, fairly well spread, but with a lot of people who are based actually in Nashville, which is something that's, uh, that's great based on the conversation earlier. Um, th those were the kind of core questions. There were some other areas that I think are important for you to be aware of. Um, we pulled some statistics on 
visitors to Nashville. So uh, actually our site is used by many of the, the, the North American employees as a non-technical training center and also as a core meeting space. The attraction of coming to Nashville is very high for many people, as I'm sure you'll share. Um, we spent, our expense system is quoting that we spent close to $2 million of non-Nashville based employees coming into the city with hotels, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. So actually it's a source of external revenue coming in beyond the employee base. Um, from a contact to universities and other things, um, I'm personally a member of the governance board for TSU and their supply chain uh, program within the university. We also have strong links with MTSU as well in terms of our sales skills and connections with the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. We have a formalized graduate hiring program that covers many universities beyond those, but we have particular connections to those. Um, in addition, I think a key program for us is uh, looking to see how we can help facilitate um, the movement of uh, service members leaving Fort Campbell into the employee base. We have a very active veterans uh, ERG, um, and we've established a program to help those service members get ready for um, non-service based employment. And actually, I'm, I'm going out to Fort Campbell next month where we have a program with the Chamber of Commerce to try and kick that off in a bit more, with a bit more of a formal structure around it. Uh, finally, the, the, from an ERG perspective, we have a black uh, ERG that's, a, that's just announced that a chapter is being formed in Nashville as well. And we were proud to fly the Berg flag uh, during the whole, excuse me, I can't breathe, during the whole June, uh, Juneteenth uh, month of recognition. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. There's, there's lots of fantastic information. Do you have any information on average salary as well? Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, yes. Uh, the average salary for the 766 jobs on the grant is 66.5. And, okay. and actually, we do have more employees than that, but part of the terms of our grant is that we only include employees after they've been employed by six months. So long, sure. Yeah. Okay, so that's about 67,000 yes, per year, sure. correct? Okay. Well, th well, thank you for, for sharing that. I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues if there's any questions. I'll... Anything over here? Board Member Forrester, Vice Chair Segal. Just want to thank you for sharing so much information and being so transparent. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll just say, too, you know, it's, it's like I said, again, very intentional on this board. And clearly you all are, uh, you know, doing the doing the right things as far as opening up your talent pool and the organizations and the outreach that you're that you're doing. So, um, yeah, thank you. Very forthcoming. So thank we appreciate it. Welcome. And we're glad you're here. And, and uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, Margaret or Bob, anything else on this one when he's cover? All right. As it relates to the grant of the annual performance and approval of annual incentive of the grantee payment for calendar year into to, in December 3rd of 2020 for Phillips. Do we have a motion on the table? So moved. All right, thank you. Count Board Member Allen. We have a second by Vice Chair Segal. Any discussion? All right, let's move for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, outstanding. Any opposed? All right, motion carry. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. We, we greatly appreciate it. All right, I thank you all board. We obviously had a lot to cover today. We have a couple more items. I will, Bob, if you'll come sit in my seat very quickly. And, I figured out how to make this work. Oh, there we go. All how right, about I'll that? Say, let's go back to old business item A. I already gave an overview of the project. So if you just, there's nothing we need to vote on, but if you want to just give us a, um, quick update and uh, take any questions that the board has. Great, and uh, thank you again uh, for your attention to this. This is just a technicality. What happened is the Tennessee Housing Development Agency has to give periodic commitment letters when the state has provided any kind of funding, grants, et cetera on projects, and in particular, um, this project, Nashville Leased Housing Associates, is a limited partnership that has a project going on on Dickerson and uh, 900 Dickerson Pike, and some of you may have seen it. It is moving forward very well. Um, 259 units is the 
target, but what's so one of the things I think that's so important about it is that these are uh, units for a workforce housing project, multifamily affordable workforce housing project. And that's so important, especially up at Dickerson Pike. So nothing, I, I just wanted to bring you forward because they have a closing date set of November 30, so they'll be back before this board uh, to seek approval of the final issuance of, of bonds, nothing that you have to do now. But since the Tennessee Housing Development Agency sent this commitment letter and asked for um, its acceptance, not only by the borrower, but also by the issuer, and since we had a change in the regime uh, with a new chair, uh, we needed to get the new chair to sign uh, the agreement. Uh, portion of it. It does not bind the board in any way. Uh, that is why I'm here. That's why I said what I had to say, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Board Member Allen, any questions? Board Member Davis, and again, this has been before us in the past. Anything for Board Member Johnson or Board Member Forrester? Vice to go? Okay. And there's nothing we need to vote on today, but they will, you anticipate they'll be back before us again later this year. Correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, quick overview. Uh, let's move to uh, let's move down. Thank you all for your flexibility today. Let's move on to item six approval of financial matters. I don't know that we have any. Uh, Margaret Walker is going to give you. I will report the fund balance. Our fund balance is. Sixty eight thousand five hundred ninety three dollars and twenty seven cents. $68,593. And 27 cents. And there's no, there's nothing we need to approve though, correct today? No, because you don't need to approve that. Um, I just normally report the fund balance and that's just our leftover funds that remain in fund balance each month. And that varies each month. It usually builds a tiny amount. Yes. And I usually report that. Yes, thank you. And we obviously our previous meeting was here, so there's no parking or anything yes. that we need to reimburse for. So, um, so thank you for the You're update. Right. What, what's our cap again? <sighs> I just want to make sure we don't I, get away with that. Like that. I don't, from my recollection, great question, Vice Chair. From my record, I I thought that what we did. Uh, <laughs> And I guess this was two years ago, um, was that we had a lot more, and I don't remember the exact oh, yeah, number. And, you know, we were, like one, yeah, and the board voted in approval to give that back to Metro. Uh, I want to say that was 2019, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. Okay. I can report that to you. I was just looking at that a, a few days ago, actually. Okay. Uh, it was a rather sizable amount that was returned to Metro, right. and we were, we were looking at it, and I, it was several hundred thousand dollars, I believe. Yes. It was. There were some old bond issuances in there, but I just can't remember what we kept the floor at, and it seems like it's growing again, and so I didn't know if it was better to... Well, let's... Let's uh, maybe for the next meeting, uh, Margaret and or and Courtney, if you all can look into. I don't recall. Um, lots happened in two years. I I don't recall that we set a cap. I just know that we 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 had some we had several meetings where this was discussed, um, and and lots of discussion around if it made more sense for. And you know, obviously, I don't. I think there are several people on the who were not on the board then. Uh, but there was a lot of discussion around if we needed to keep that money uh, that had been sitting there, but due to budget, and I think that year there was not a property tax increase as well, um, the board ultimately voted to give those funds back to, to Metro, um, as they said, unused. Um, I just want to make one clarification. Sure. Um, 
the using the phrase returned or give back to Metro is probably inaccurate. Okay, it, it correct was me. It's really a transfer of funds. Okay. This, these funds were uh, had been built up in the accounts of the IDB over the course of many years um, because of some old bond issuances and the structure of the old bond issuances were such that at the end of or at maturity in order to transfer property back to the original owner, there was a, um, I believe 10% of the bond issue would get paid to Metro for that transfer. Uh, and and the, the way that bonds are structured, the, the modern uh, methodology for the bond structure is different from that. So we no longer have that 10%. So those funds have been built up over time. State law, um, uh, there we go. States okay. that uh, funds that the, the, the board's funds in to the benefit of the metropolitan government um, as it's creating uh, municipality. And uh, since the board had not utilized those funds for a number of years or had any plans to utilize those funds, the decision was made that a transfer of those funds to Metro was uh, in the best course of interest for both parties. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Transfer. I'll use the word transfer. Okay. Well, and I know I recall our governing document had a threshold where anything over that amount was transferred, but it was really, really high, and there was conversation at that point as to whether it should be changed. Changed. And yes. I just don't remember if we actually did it or not. There was a meeting much earlier than when the actual decision to, to make the transfer was mm -hmm. made. And um, the decision to have a cap for operating expenses for the board was um, uh, set very was set very high, much higher than the actual need for the board and for the board's expenses. And so, at at some point, I think it was the time that the transfer was made. A decision was made as to what amount would be kept by the board and needed by the board. Um, for uh, for potential future expenses. And I, off the top of my head, do not recall that amount, but we can certainly go back and try to um, look through some old minutes or try to determine what that amount was. But oh. it's, de it's definitely, I, I believe it's under 100, if not at 100. Okay. Thank you. Yep, I thank can you. tell you that since the time of the transfer, there has not been a much growth in the fund balance. Um, I mean, each month, the growth is very tiny. And so the fund balance is not growing at a very, it's growing very slowly. Okay. So there has not been much growth since that transfer was made. Is the, is the growth due to interest? It's due to interest and the interest rate is less than 1%. So, I mean, we may earn less than $20 right now of interest. So that's really our only growth, so. And we, okay, well, well, thank you for that. Yes, Margaret, if you'll check on that, we'll, we can have further discussion at our, at our next meeting on that. All right, moving along to item seven, uh, schedule of future IDB meetings. Obviously, I wanna thank everyone. Uh, we had to change the date for this meeting to, to be able to be here in Sony West. And obviously, over the past year and a half, uh, Due to COVID, we've met at different times virtually, uh, but certainly uh, put this on the agenda uh, because I know there's not a time that 100% works for everyone, but it would certainly be better for us to have a set meeting time. That's what we used to have, a set day, a set time, whether that be the second Thursday or fourth Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, that's what we should do. That would be beneficial. And I can tell you all, obviously, from trying to schedule here, uh, when I first started, we had most of our meetings at uh, one met downtown in the Metro building. Obviously, it's a, that space is much smaller. And one of the reasons why we started having our meetings here uh, is due to the uh, more convenient and, and better parking situation here at Sony West. But certainly there are a lot of organizations that, that use this. So the, be the more in advance we can schedule our meetings, the, the better chance we have. Um, so I would... My recommendation is that we at least schedule, pick a day, pick a time, and schedule our at least our meetings through the end of the year. Um, so anyway, I'll start with if anyone has a suggestion about a day or time. And again, we've always met since I've been on the board at 10 a.m. There was some discussion 
at a previous at our at last month's meeting about potentially meeting at 1 p.m. Um, so that's certainly an option if if people prefer that as opposed to meeting in the morning. Uh, so I I will open it up to to the group if if they have a recommendation on that. I think you just need to put a the doodle things, because um, it's it can be different for every one of us every every day. So once it's set, I can schedule around it. Well, well that's what I'm asking. Is there a, is there a day that works better or time that works better, and that'll be the day we meet? Um, no, no comment there. I, whatever you decide, I'll figure it out. Okay. Nigel, I like the idea of setting like say it's always the fourth Thursday. That's where I'm going. I would say if we're if we're doing like the second or. Third Thursday, both September and October are going to get hairy because September, the third Thursday is Yom Kippur. So mm -hmm. that's a day that um, some folks will not be able to attend. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at October, you're looking at a lot of us have fall kids. Break. And we've yep. got two fall breaks in a row if you're looking at public and private schools covered by this board that kind of knock out those. Don't we have a standard date already set? Huh? Don't, don't we have a standard date already set? That's what I thought. We, about we used to have a standard date. And, I just don't remember. We but, used yeah. to, but we, we kind of... Yeah. Oh, Margaret. Uh, Does it have to be on Thursday? No. Thursday. No, 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 no. That's why we're having a conversation. We're just trying... I just use that as an example. Okay. Well, but we're trying to get it so also... Also, this for people that need to come before us or, for, for, or guests that want to come to the meeting, they always know, hey... The Industrial Development Board meeting, they meet on the second Wednesday or the third Wednesday. So yeah. that's also part of it, too. I would agree with um, Christina then on sending out the doodle. Okay. Board Member Forrester, do you have any preference? Fourth, and again, it could be Wednesday, Thursday, but I think the goal would be set the time. Yeah, I think Mondays are always bad for everybody. Right. Do and are we? Do we? Pre, and obviously, there's some folks not here. Um, do we prefer mornings at ten? Are we still? Are we good with that time frame? Yes. yes. Okay. And so, I would just ask that if we're going to do Friday, that it also not be the last Friday of the month. Because yep, for but me, that's closing. Really <laughs> closing. All right. Well, what about the third Friday? Maybe of the month. Ten a.m. I am out every Thursday and Friday, third Friday until November. I can't do the, the third of October. Oh, wait, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do the third. Maybe the doodle is that. So, Council Member Davis, do you have any, any preference on a day or time? Okay. Do you all, are we all in agreement and align that it would be better to have a set day for our meetings, whether that's the second Wednesday? Let me ask, what about Wednesdays for folks? That works. That's a better day. Wednesdays are a little hard. Uh, let's see here. Chair, I think with all our schedules, um, if we can get a, like a consensus now, great, but a doodle might help. We could do a doodle poll. So we've but, done that, and everybody yeah. has different times. Right. So yeah. That, that's like, why I'm saying today the we, we you know, we and, and hopefully by setting it in advance, then people can, can work around. So that's why I was saying that, because uh, this has been kind of an ongoing thing for the, well, for I thought the past it was, year and a half. So it's not a set date already, or and it's been moved around? No, we've, moved, we, we've had meetings on every, uh, the past year and a half since COVID. We've, we've met on all different days. We've always met in the morning, but uh, you know, for about five, four and a half years, I was on the board. We never met on Fridays, so we start. That's been something we start since COVID, which is fine. So, can uh, we get three suggestions and vote on it? I like that. I idea. like the third Wednesday. Yeah, the third third Wednesday. Wednesday. That works for me again. 
you're far enough into the month that if people want to get onto the agenda for a month, they still have time. That's they fine. Call, oh, it's September 1. I need to get on the September agenda. You call that day and get on it. So can you propose that and put it on the calendar with an invite? That yeah, start, well, invite? Let's, let's do this. Start Wednesday? Yes. Start Wednesday. Board Member Johnson, does that work for you? I'll make it work. Uh, September, okay. I won't be here on the third week of September, but... In general? In general. So. Okay, thank you. Wednesday? Yeah, that's fine. In the morning. In the morning, yep. Still morning. Still morning. Mark? You're good. We're looking at third Wednesday is going to be the new date for our meetings, 10 o'clock, third Wednesday. Does that work for both of you? That, that should works. work for me. All right. So, Joy, you know your homework. I'm making sure the first third Wednesday. No, I got you. All right. Well, with that said, I'll, I'll take a motion to adjourn unless there's anything else. So moved. Do we have second. a second? Third. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for your patience today. Obviously, we had a lot to go through, so moved, and we'll adjourn. You all have a wonderful day. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.